Maybe. Sammy Lula. Luch. <laughs> oh, yeah. It started out called something else, and next year it was called something else. Now it's a Italian Studies panel. Um, and uh, what this is, it's an opportunity for students who have done uh, work uh, in a wide range of classes from history to history to literature and language uh, to present on research that, that they've done, uh, writing that they've done uh, on Italian studies. And um, you know, uh, this could be uh, students, it could be faculty. Had students and faculty presenting on the same panels uh, in the past. A wide range of topics from uh, you know, the paintings of Artemisia Gentileschi to uh, siege warfare in the early 16th century. So it's been uh, a really interesting and I think rewarding opportunity for uh, you know, the best students here working in Italian studies to present uh, their, uh, their work. Um, and this year, right, we have uh, some students who come from a very special kind of experiment that Professor Pekini and I uh, um, uh, undertook, right, this last semester, right, which is a team talk class. And if you want to, yeah. So in the fall, actually, uh, we're considering joining some classes together in an informal way. So um, I teach Italian here at Tenas Dartmouth. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, and last semester it was the first time for me to teach Italian literature and translation. Um, so we had decided that since Professor Snyder um, usually teaches medieval Renaissance Reformation courses, we thought that it would be an interesting idea to do a team talk course. So we had some students who were enrolled in both of our courses, and they did uh, a joint project, so to speak, um, for the both of us. And today you'll actually be hearing from some of those students who did do that, and uh, that's their original research, so we're actually quite proud. Um, and especially this year, because for the first few years that we've done the panel, it was primarily faculty presenting their original research, and, which was great, but we wanted to involve a lot of the UMass students and, and really showcasing their work, you know, something that they can they can show to graduate schools or their employers later on. So this year we have a wonderful team of students doing this. Um, so I said, I suppose without further ado, you have something to add as well? Um, well, I mean, I think one of the great things about the students this semester, the projects that we chose, is that there's a lot of resonance between the projects, so we have uh, students writing, uh, several students writing on Dante, right, and on the politics of Dante. Uh, and uh, uh, Sam, uh, Council Ed Welch, and Chelsea, right, uh, both wrote papers on Dante, and so we're sort of grouping them together um, as a team. Uh, and then uh, Dylan Benoit and uh, Justin Rizzo uh, wrote about the Venetian shipyard, the Arsenale, so we're grouping them together as a, as a team. So, uh, you know, there'll be uh, lots of uh, points of comparison, uh, some questions and discussion that can take place uh, between uh, the two authors of each theme. So I think it's a particularly interesting year for this panel. Yeah. Um, the other thing to mention too is that this is actually part of the uh, Italian City Seminar Series. Uh, so the Provost has graciously uh, given us a grant to fund these kinds of, things, kinds of things throughout the entire year. Um, so this will be one of the events that we have left. And I also wanted to mention very quickly um, another event that we'll have on April 20th. So that'll be the last event that we have for our seminar series. All right, we have a colleague of ours from Fitchburg State University joining us. Her name is Rina Chakita. And she'll be coming on April 20th in LARTS uh, 374 at 2 o'clock. So I just want to let you know for the next event that we have going on. Um, after that, we will actually show our last film of the semester on the 25th of April. Um, it's based upon the horror theme that we've been doing this entire uh, semester, and more than likely we'll be showing the film Suspiria. Um, so if you make it that, would be great. At seven o'clock in this building, and actually in this room, um, April 25th. Um, also, there's a sign-in sheet in case you haven't uh, signed it yet. You don't have to pass um, just sign in your name, and if you'd like to hear about these kinds of events that we'll be doing in the future, just also jot down your email address and you'll receive uh, periodic emails from me, uh, from Professor Snyder, about these kinds of events. And an invitation to join. Yeah, that's it. Great. Well, thank you very much for coming, and I'd like to say, without further ado, this is our first presenters.
compartmentalized ours because while they while they are similar, they're also kind of different. Um, You go, boy. <laughs> oh, that's nice. Dante damned a lot of people. What does this mean for Dante? Um, and kind of just starting with a brief biography, he was born in uh, 1265 in Florence to a, uh, well, they weren't noble, but they were a rich uh, mercantile family. Um, the Padiades, or Padiades, I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce it, but I'm not from Florence, so it doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> his family was part of the wealth party, which we'll touch on later, but basically it's just some noble people back in the day who thought that they were better than people who weren't part of the nobility. Uh, his mother dies when he's 10. I don't know why I chuckled, it's not funny, but uh, in 1277, uh, see, he gets betrothed to Gemma Donati, whose, uh, whose family is part of the nobility, and they are also Guelphs, uh, which is significant. And I'll talk about that again later. Uh, Beatrice is his long lost love he talks about in the Inferno. In fact, she's the one who sends Virgil to go and find him to take him through the Inferno and up to heaven. Uh, well, at least up to like limbo. It's not limbo. What's the other name for it? Purgatory. Purgatory. Thank you, guys. Uh, to take him up to Purgatory and then Beatrice takes him the rest of the way. But she dies. By that time, Dante's already married to this woman, Gemma Donati. And uh, instead of mourning silently, he writes a book about how he was in love with Beatrice, uh, which is really awkward when you're already married. Um, in uh, the year 1300, he is elected the position of prior, which is the highest, or second highest, really, because there's like, it's the second highest position in government that you could be in Florence. Uh, and then he gets banished in 1302, uh, which is a big reason why he wrote his book, and again, into it later. Uh, then he writes the Inferno to mock all the people who had a hand in banishing him, and some people who had nothing to do with it. Um, and then he completes his Divine Com uh, Comedy, uh, which is, of course, when he goes through Purgatory in Heaven as well, and then he dies the year, the year after in Venice. So he died in a nice place that he'll be talking about next. Um, okay, so this is my overview of the commune in Florence. There's actually a lot more to it than just this little excerpt right here. Uh, so basically, the commune was a proto-republican system that was put in place in, fifth, in eh, at least in Florence, was put in place in the year uh, bleh, 1115 uh, CE. Uh, so 1115 CE. Um, and Basically, what would happen is you had a series of consuls, uh, not consuls, but councils, and uh, those council men would be elected by uh, literally pulling names out of a hat. And all that you had to be to qualify as part of this council uh, was a man of Florence, or a man of Florence. Uh, there would be more regulations put on top of it later on. Uh, Specifically because after some wars between the Ghibelines and Welfs, we have right here, uh, like I said before, uh, the Welfs were nobility. They thought that they were better than the Ghibelines, who were a bunch of rich merchants who thought that they could have fancy things and the Ghibelines didn't like it. Not the Ghibelines, the Welfs didn't like it. There's a lot of cheese in this, I apologize. Um, so, ultimately, they fight. Uh, the Guelph, Spanish, the Ghibellines, then the Popolo, who are a bunch of middle class people who are fed up with the rich people's nonsense because they're fighting all the time, decided that they were going to take control of the government and they did it. 
so that they made it so that a lot of the Ghibellines could come back because the Ghibellines weren't that much different from the Guelphs. I mean, not the Guelphs, the Popolo. Um, Vlad, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. They weren't that much different from the Popolo. Um, and then the Popolo made it so that nobody who was from a noble family could uh, be part of the Priors, which essentially cut off all uh, old nobility from having uh, a major political presence in Florence, except through like, uh, God, what's the word? Except through like, uh, like, say I'm a friend with of a, of a noble, and then he tells me what to do. Like indirectly, they could have power, but not directly. That's what I meant to say. Anyways, these uh, divisions translate later on into the black and white wells, which is a breakdown of the normal wells. Uh, over the same argument of we like the Holy Roman Emperor and we like the Pope. Uh, basically, there were conflicts in between uh, the Pope and the Holy Roman Empire, which, as we all know, is in Germany. Uh, it has no place calling itself the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, and they like to divide lines based off of that. Although, uh, the White Wolves were more about independence for Florence than they were about uh, su supreme imperial rule. Uh, the Popolo stayed the same. They were kind of just there and were like, let's not let rich people own everything. Uh, so they were, they were pretty cool. Um, okay, so in Florence, familial connections were made, were like giant important things. And Dante kind of didn't care about them at all, which was really bad for him. And we know this because as a child he was born into the Guelph family, well, into a Guelph family, not the Guelph family. Uh, who had really close ties with the Donati. And the Donati uh, later on became the, essentially one of the, the, like the linchpin uh, leaders of the Black Wells. Uh, and, as, and Dante, instead of following that line, sides with the White Wells, who are their direct opponent. So this is a direct affront to his family because he married into the Donati. And it's an affront to the rest of his family because they would have sided with the Donati. Uh, they were already Guelphs. But he does this because he meets a fantastic individual named uh, Guido Cavalcanti, who I believe I have up here. I might not. Anyways, Guido was a white Guelph, and a scholar, and a writer, and he was pretty cool. Uh, and he basically convinces Dante to, uh, to join the, wealth, uh, the white Guelph party until Dante decides to banish him. And I think that I took the note. Oh no, that's him being banished. Anyways, Dante decides to banish him because Guido's fighting people in the streets, and we can't have that because it, uh, it ruins uh, civil life, I guess. Uh, I don't know. But he also banishes Corso Donati, which is a big deal because that is his wife's cousin and his best, his childhood friend's brother. He was friends with her, his sister, and actually he puts her in heaven. Uh, in the Divine Comedy, which is kind of ironic because he banishes uh, the sister. Um, political fluidity. As I kind of touched upon, Dante didn't really care about where he was on the political spectrum. Uh, and this is kind of concerning. And later on, it, like, as you'll see, it translates into uh, uh, almost a hatred because he burns all of his bridges, switching sides. Uh, he starts as a Guelph, then he decides he wants to be a white Guelph. Uh, instead of going with the Black Wells. Then he decides to banish both Guido Cavalcanti and Corso Donati, who are on opposing sides, but this means that he's now caused an affront to both sides of the game. There's, uh, it'd be like, it, it's like swearing off uh, both the Democrat and the Republican Party today, uh, which may not sound like such a bad idea, but back then it was a horrible idea. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I got lost in, in words. Oh, and then later on, after he's banished, he's kind of spiteful, and he doesn't really direct that perfectly, as uh, we'll come to know. Um, because, okay, so he banishes Corso Donati, right? Then Corso goes and gets the Pope, and we'll touch on that later. I'm realizing that I'm talking ahead of myself, and I'm sorry about this, I'm new to this. Uh, but uh, anyways, after he's banished, he continues to support the Holy Roman Emperor, except more fervently this time. Instead of uh, 
instead of using him as an excuse to have divisions between the factions, he actually goes to rallies. And uh, for example, when the Holy Roman Empire uh, Emperor is inaugurated because the old one dies, no one comes in, he goes to support the new Holy Roman Emperor, who's hotly disputed because the Pope doesn't crown him. Uh, because Pope Boniface got backhanded and died, which is almost our next slide. That's kind of disappointing. Oh, oh yeah, and there's there's disappointed Dante, uh, or confused Dante. I, I really like it. Um, yeah. Okay, so health components as a, uh, well, as a tool for validation. Uh, hell, of course, as everyone knows, has nine layers, which I wrote down because it's impossible to remember all of them. Uh, we have limbo, lust, gluttony, greed, anger, heresy, violence, fraud, and treachery. And what this allows him to do is he gets to condemn people however he sees fit. He gets to set the punishments and the crimes uh, that will get you into hell, which is a fantastic tool when you're writing hate mail about literally everybody in Florence. Um, but as we're going to see, he, he uses this uh, even against people who would have been his allies in life, uh, a lot of them are already dead by the time he's writing this, that's the only reason why I specified. Uh, so he, he uses it to condemn kind of uh, fluidly, and uh, this to me points to, to an anger towards the political divide, uh, because it's, it's destroying Florence in his opinion. Uh, but there's, there's a nice little cycle, or circles of hell. I know that there should be one more, but I don't know why they, I, I assume they just thought that college students couldn't commit treachery because this is the college student's version of Dante's hell. Um, although I think that we're perfectly capable of treachery. Uh, okay, <laughs> so this is his enemies. First up, we have Pope Boniface, who I've been talking about way too much. Uh, and then there's Filippo Argenti, who we'll get to in a minute. Uh, Pope Boniface. Uh, okay, so he is found in the Ten Malibulge, uh in the Pit of Simony, which is the eighth, the eighth Pit of Hell, or not Pit of Hell, eighth layer of Hell, which is, oh my god, one second, eighth is fraud. Yes, fraud. So he's in uh, the Circle of Fraud, which is, doesn't sound like a nice place to be. Anyways, he's accused of Simony, which is basically just selling church relics for money. Uh, it's just bad. Uh, and then uh, he supports, he's actually not supported by the Black Wolves, he supports the Black Wolves because in 1301, when, or in 1300, Corso Donati, who is the guy who Dante banishes and is his cousin by marriage, goes to get the Pope to ask him to help him. Uh, get rid of the white wolves, or to, to end the violence in Florence, which at first is good, but then uh, the, the Popolo refuse to let up their control because they're firmly in control of the government. So the Pope uh, sends in Charles Valois, who is a French prince, to uh, occupy the city. And then that same prince ultimately gets rid of uh, the Popolo. He kicks out uh, the the white wells, he banishes them, including Dante, and reinserts a bunch of people uh, into the government from the Black Wealth Party so that it's under his supporters' controls and the people who he supported's control. Um, fun fact about him, he in his pit of hell, his punishment is that he's face down in a hole that is on fire forever, uh, which is reminiscent of a Florentine punishment for assassins where they would dig a hole, put you face down into the hole, and then bury you alive. Um, which is kind of like, if you put it together, it's a metaphor saying that he assassinated Florence's political structure, which gives Dante every right to hate him because he's perpetuating these divisions that Dante hates. Uh, that Dante got banished by him, I'm sure he's upset. Um, the next guy, Filippo Argeni, that, that lovely man, down on the side of the boat. He's down at the River Styx, which is uh, the circle of agony, or anger, not agony, sorry, similar words. Uh, the circle of anger. And he's in the circle of anger for, well, there's only two real reasons that I can come up with. One, he's a black bow. So there is some symbolism there because the circle of anger, aka the River Styx, is black. Uh, like the, it's, it's a murky, black, goopy river. So, 
his skin would have been covered in this goop representing that he is a black wealth and in life we know that he was. Additionally, a lot of contemporary uh, interpreters believe that uh, Filippo Argenti had stolen from Dante's house after he was banished, which I personally think is a funny reason to condemn someone to hell, uh, but Dante took it very seriously. Um, but that was just an example of, you know, Dante, Dante was good about banishing his enemies, and now he's also good about banishing his friends. Uh, Cavalcanti de Cavalcanti, unfortunately, the only picture for him is from the Dante's Inferno video game, which came out in like <laughs> 2005 or something, like it's old, uh, because there's no actual pictures of him, but because he's mentioned he's in the game. And then Brunetto Latini, um, we're going to start with Cavalcanti. Cavalcanti de Cavalcanti is the father of Guido Cavalcanti, who is Dante's best friend, who he condemned, and then Guido died afterwards, because in his banishment, Guido uh, went north and then stayed in a small town that was around some marshes, and then he got malaria. Then they let him come back, and he died in Florence. Um, so Dante indirectly murdered his son, uh, which is kind of bad, or at least he had a hand in it because the other priors were held. Um, anyways, he's found in the sixth ring of hell, which is heresy. He's there because supposedly he, uh, he didn't believe in God, and not believing in God is heresy to 1300s. Florentines. Um, but personally, I think that that reason is kind of reaching, like it's grabbing. He's trying to come up with a reason to put this guy there. Uh, but it's still, again, strange because it's the father of his best friend. You don't go around condemning, uh, like I wouldn't be like, Chelsea, your father's horrible. You know, like I like Chelsea, I wouldn't say that to her. That'd be, <laughs> yeah, like I wouldn't send somebody to hell for, for no reason. So he's very uh, open about condemning people from similar parties, and presumably this guy was a Ghibelline because his son was a white wealth. Um, but also by condemning him, you're condemning his son. Like, you know, there's a direct familial connection there. So he's more than okay with condemning white wealths and black wealths. Uh, and then our next guy, who's Brunetto Latini, um, he was Dante's tutor when Dante was a child, he was his mentor. And in fact, they have a pretty, that pretty nice conversation when they're in hell. Like, it's a little awkward, but like, it's good. But he's accused of homosexuality, so he's put in the seventh circle, which is a circle of violence, because apparently homosexuality was violent to Florentines. Uh, honestly, I, that, that's, that's the only reason why he's down there. He was also a Guelph, uh, which could have added credence to, to to, to damning him, uh, because it represents, again, that same political division which Dante was up in arms against. Uh, okay, so tying everything together. Uh, Dante didn't like political division. It was something that uh, he was very passionate about hating. Um, he shows this by condemning Florentines kind of indiscriminately for their, for their actions of uh, uh, while fighting each other for, for lacking unity. Uh, and we know this because he, he very obviously loves Florence throughout his writings. Uh, he talks about how the beauty of Florence is, is, is destroyed by uh, like the, you know, the horrible people who live in it. And he talks about how uh, there are more people in hell from Florence than from anywhere else. Um, so while he does love it, he very easily identifies that uh, it's it's some, something's going wrong. He subverts social norms to do this, uh, which we saw with the family, uh, well, with his betrayal of his own family, uh, frequently, frequently betraying his own family, his married family, his born into family, his, family, his friendly fa family, I don't know how to say that exactly. Uh, and he openly challenges Boniface, who is a very obvious, uh, individual who is attempting to, to tweak Florence into his own liking. He's trying to remove Florence's independence, and uh, while I didn't write this up there, I personally believe that Dante would have been a uh, pro-Holy Roman Emperor, like, reconquering of Florence, because the Holy Roman Emperor kind of just taxed people. He, he was like, hey, give me money, I'm going to live up here. 
because back in the day, he got his butt kicked by a bunch of Florentines, well, not Florentines, but Northern Italians, and it didn't go, go so well for him. But uh, the last page is my bibliography. Um, I hope you enjoy it. Woo! Got a boy!